and necklaces and rings, you know, hand carved. And um, they would have uh, fruits and vegetables for sale. It was kind of fun. And uh, you look at some of the artists, some of the artists were, you know, so so. Um, trying, to, trying to kind of make a living doing some of this artwork stuff. Uh, similar when we were in Africa, you know, you'd see all kinds of people just trying, and, and they had skill, when well, you're off my But this one guy, he just had, he had a style I really liked. And so I went up to him, and I was just learning the language, and I kind of bleh, bleh, butchered out some tough vision. But I got it out there enough that he understood. And then what's funny is, is uh, after I tried hard for a little while, he came back to me in pretty good broken English. He's like, oh man, you let me struggle all this time. <laughs> <laughs> Here you can speak. And, and, and so we, we started this, this relationship. But he, I want to say he was probably Seventh day Adventist, which is at least where we are, we're at, probably the predominant uh, religion, if you will. And it's different than Seventh day Adventism here in that it is highly, highly, highly works based for salvation. And so it's hard to say whether or not they're trusting the work of Christ individually or if they're kind of doing a, I'm trusting my works and then Christ. So anyways, but this guy, I, I said, hey, I'll, I really want to have you draw. And I had specific pieces in mind. And I said, can I meet with you again? And can we go over this? And so anyway, long story short, I came back from another time. I said, here's the first three I'd like you to do. I want to, I want to do a picture of the resurrection. And I have some ideas in mind, and I just kind of told my ideas. I printed off a couple things off my computer, and I said, but you, you, you do it how you want. And he made this really cool picture of a landscape, Golgotha, or not Golgotha, I'm sorry. Um, this was the resurrection. He made a picture of this landscape with this tomb, and, and all the light is coming out of the empty tomb. Maybe you've seen it before. It's, for me, it's special because it was like, this guy did it. You know, it wasn't like I went to an art guy or, yeah, I took these ideas. And then he did one of, of, Golgotha and the crucifix. Really, he did a really good job, like having the two And I had him do two other ones. I had him do Jesus walking on water, one one of power. I'm just showing that he is he's Lord of creation. And the last one I had him do, and this one when I it was the last one I had him do. So this is over months. And he, he would get the ideas, and he would be gone for weeks on end, and I'd get this message sent to my Digicel phone saying, it's ready. The last one, he came, he said, oh, ben, 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 ben. This blood, we need more get out of which means this is the best one I've done for you. This is, you're going to like this part. And uh, it was, it's the one we have in our house. It's the seven, it's um, yeah. six yeah. days of creation. Seven, you know, seven days of creation. And uh, if you look at it closely, you can just see these different aspects of how he did it. And he actually... I would give him the scriptures, and I'd bring my little Bible, and I'd say, this is what I'd like. And we would read the account together in the, in the trade language. We would read the account, and I'd say, I want you to try to show this from scripture. And then he would kind of, so anyways, so I was going to bring one of those I forgot to. But the one I was going to bring in was a picture of the crucifixion, okay? Crucifixion. Christ on the cross, Robert, and he had, he had a couple, you could see, like, officials down below, guys that cost lots of money. Okay. I was going to say, that's our, that's the end point. Okay, the study today is, I titled the biblical account of the details of Christ's final days before his death. This is what we're going to focus on today. And we're going to use Tim's encouragement of read it, read it, read it, to compare in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, some, not all, if I get another day, if I'm like sub, day number two, I have more, but we're just going to get through a few today of some of these accounts, and we want to look at it from each of the gospel writers because it just, it just again, sheds light on that story. It makes it bigger. Here. So here's what I want you to do today, okay? I want you to, um, Garnix, I'm going to make you kind of group group one together. You're going to have a little family discussion. Jim and Ronnie, you group two. Um, ben, I'm going to put you with Wilma, group three, and then Stan and Grandpa, okay, group one. What I want you to do is this. I'm just going to give you like two, three minutes. For you, without without opening your Bibles yet, just say, yeah, what, what things do I know happened in those last final days before the cross? Okay, don't, don't talk about, well, when he was on the cross, I remember they put a sign up, we're not there yet. We're not going to hit that. In those last couple days, what do you remember? And then let's go to the scriptures and we'll look at some of those accounts together and just kind of flesh it out. Does 
Sound good? So you got two or three minutes. You can do this at home. <laughs> if you're at home, what do you remember about the last couple days before Christ's crucifixion? Okay? And Marcus can set, go. And I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> Is basically trying to say that he doesn't have blood on his hands. Right. Hands. How long did it take? Long? Yeah. That's not. Really long, is that? Are we talking weeks before, or is this all within two, three days? So it's, today's I've never the about trials. Right. Well, that, yeah. For the most part, so. Um, I've never really like tried to see how right. many days I've been like, for right. the trials. I think it's simply it's my time. I think I'm not sure. Uh, what can you say? Is it just betrayed him? Peter's used to him. Oh, yep. Yep. Um, what do you say? Judas betrayed him. Tell Peter he would deny him. And so there's the three denials in there. I think some of those were in front of yeah, and that's before before the trial, right? Yeah. Thirty seconds. Yeah. Is it switching cameras? Or no, it's just it's blurry for some reason. Maybe it's when he's not the building it's okay. You can always turn the camera off and just listen. Okay. okay. Good. I mean, we can keep going. I can keep going. You can keep. Good. Some of the things I just heard out loud, we're not going to get to all of them because um, there was some. There's just a lot in here to look at. So we're going to look at. I've got. I put. I prepared for six. I think we may realistically more get through like half. I know, but it's fine. Again, I get the sub job again on the radio. Okay. <laughs> let's let's look at this. We're, we're gonna we're gonna just discuss this together, and then we're gonna go to the scriptures, and we're gonna literally write down things we see in Matthew. If you see something new, we'll add it in these other areas. And we're not gonna write the whole Bible up here; just kind of like shorten main things we see. Okay. So, question number one: We're gonna investigate is who really wanted to get rid of Jesus? We know he was crucified. We know there's a number of players involved here, but but who who wants to get rid of them? Okay, I'm hearing the Pharisees. Let's pause here. I'm sorry. There are a lot. Good. Ben, you said Pharisees. Why do you think the Pharisees want to get rid of Jesus? Um, <laughs> they don't want to lose their power. Yeah. And I think you said Jews. Jews. Yeah. yeah. Why? Why do the Jews want to get rid of him? Well, well, he was claiming to be God, right? Yeah, he was claiming to be God, and he was a man, and they they couldn't see the the twofold nature of, of God there. Yeah. Good. Okay. Let's take a look at the scriptures because when I when I was thinking about this initially, I was kind of thinking, oh, the heavy players were probably, you know, were they were they were they theological issues or were they political issues? And so let's see what the scriptures have to say. Go to Matthew's account on this, Matthew chapter 26. And we're gonna look at verses one through five. Okay. Matthew 26, 1 through 5. And I'm just going to take a different group each time. I'm going to start with the Garnix and we'll just keep going. So one of one of you your, or your teammates can read this. And then here's how we're going to play. Okay. Because I really want this to be interactive today. So when the Garnix start, the torch then is passed to the Black Halls, the next group, to put something on the board. And then after that, we'll open up to everybody. So if you're on deck, you're going to be the one to say, hey, here's something I see from this that answers that question. Okay, so either Jeremy, Clinton, or Holland, if you would read 26, 1 through 5, and then Ronnie or Jim, you're going to give us one thing to start that conversation, and others can jump in. And it came about that when Jesus had finished all these words, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man is to be delivered up for uh, crucifixion. Then the chief priests and the elders 
uh, of the people were gathered together in the court of the high priest named Caiaphas. And they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they were saying, not during the festival, lest a riot occur among the people. Okay, thank you, Jim. Ronnie and Jim, let's start this off. Who do we see that's trying to get rid of Jesus? Chief priests and the elders. And Jim, as I write this up here, who are those people? What does it mean to be a chief priest? And for those of us that aren't as well, first, what's the Sanhedrin? Make up of primarily the Pharisees and Sadducees. Yeah. And scribes. Do we have something like that today in today's modern religious system that you would say is kind of like a, a Sanhedrin? Yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, we have, we have religious organizations that have a board of directors yeah. and that dictates the doctrines and what how the church is. Some of them dictate who they're going to elect for their or hire for their pastors. Some congregations don't have that, that control. It's decided by their board of directors, central authority. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe it, just maybe different terminology, but but we have systems that, that have religious leaders in, in, the, in the world, and this was in their neck of the woods. If you were part of the Pharisees, Sadducees, or the Sanhedrin, you were in charge of some of the big high decision making. Okay, good. Um, I'll open it up to anybody. What else do we see in Matthew's account that you read there that, that you might throw up on the board? Anything else? I think that the Sanhedrin has an opinion of the people that they'll revolt should they crucify him. Okay. So, more popular than they are. Yeah, we're going to see this. This is an issue. They want to do it in a way that's kind of sneaky. Because they, they want to do it, they don't want to get in hot water. So we're going to see some of these details flesh out. Good, Jim. Anybody else? There's kind of a name that rung out to me as I looked at that. Caiaphas. Caiaphas. Who's this guy? Uh, he's high priest. the high priest. Okay, is he for it? Is he against it? For it. Mm -hmm. And I think he was a and he wasn't for it. Since he's the high priest. Yeah, okay. So when I think of high priest, I think this guy's, I don't want to say he's the Pope, but he's he's up there. He's powerful. He's powerful. Okay, and so we kind of see that Matthew's making the emphasis that this is this is like a, a, a theological issue. Like we don't agree with what he's claiming, who he's claiming to be, and, and we don't agree that maybe he's gonna come in here and, and uh, contend with us for our positions of power. Maybe, you know, explicitly doesn't say that, but as we keep reading, we'll see some of these thoughts. Anything else from Matthew's gospel? Okay, let's go to, there's two other gospels. We're going to Mark. Just two verses. Go to Mark, chapter 14. But if you want to leave, like, we're going to flip back and forth between these accounts. If you want to put a ribbon in Matthew or whatever, we'll be back in parts of Matthew later. Okay, Mark, chapter 14. Black Bulls, you're up. We're going to look at just the first two verses of that chapter. Mark 14, verses 1 and 2. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him, for they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. Okay. Then you and Wilma, they were on deck here. Anything that you would add up here, any other different language or words that help us kind of look at this idea of who wanted to get rid of Jesus? Scribes and priests. Yeah. Some of you, Jim said scribes, mm -hmm. um, mine says teachers of the law. Is that a, a synonymous idea? Yeah. yeah. Or, basically, the same people, just different wording. Okay. Anybody else? Thank you, man. Anybody else uh, believe anything from this? But the both those passages, they, they say they were doing it in like secret. They're, uh, we want to keep it quiet. Yeah. Yeah. Mike says, kill him. How does your guys say? Mike says, sly way. Looking for some sly way. How does yours say it? To rest Jesus. Same thing as the last one. No. Stealthy. Mike says craft. Crafty. The crafty way. 
Yeah, and we kind of get this, right? And we, and we fast forward, I heard Ronnie, Ronnie mention Gethsemane when she was talking to him. Yeah, when they do it, they do it in the garden, they do it when there's not bystanders, right? So they're looking for kind of a sneaky way to do this. Very good. One last passage, let's go to Luke's Gospel. I don't think, I didn't see it in John's, if it's there, I apologize, but I'm going to look at one more. Luke's Gospel, chapter 22. Verses 1 and 2, and Wilma and Ben, you guys are up. Gary Stanton will have the first word if you see anything in there that you think should be thrown onto our board. One verse? Um, ben or Wilma, Luke 22, Luke 22, uh, verses 1 and 2. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Okay. Anything new, Gary Stanton? It's pretty much the same stuff. Yeah, I feel like this one mentions the exact word the Passover, but I don't think yes. their verses mention the Passover. Yeah. Yeah. Did it? Thank you. But I but I was hoping somebody would kind of just put this up here. So this is the time, this is the time of year. And I don't want to go into all of it, but we do have a little bit of you have to do a little more Bible study because one of them says six days before, one of them says two, and one deals with the solar calendar, one deals with um what is the I have to look at my notes. The Essenes, the, anyways, it, it matches up when you look at it, but it can be a little confusing. But this is the time. This is it. And what's the Passover celebrated? It's really important to their culture. It seems like it's put up for a reason to be quiet about it, not that I want to excite the people. Okay. Because he's okay. healing them. <laughs> yeah. Right. Jeremy, were you going to add something? Uh, well, in Mark, it was talking about two days before the Passover. So this is like, you know, showing that there's planning involved. So it correlates with the sneakiness. Sneakiness, yeah. What, what is the Passover? Just so we're all clear. It's when the, in Egypt, when the firstborn were taken because Pharaoh's heart was burned. And, and they, had, they had to put the blood on the door frame mm -hmm. to be passed over. Yeah. You gotta rescue him, right? This is the final straw, if you will. Set free. You're allowed to go. Well, um, I lost. <laughs> okay, you no. you come back to it. Oh, okay, here it is. Yeah. Um. It my my book says uh, my Bible says that uh, the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for the some for some way to because they were afraid. Yeah. Of the people. Thank That's you. what I was going to say. Yeah. This one actually uses that word. Well, I I don't know. Greek, okay. I don't know what it is there, but Mike said they were afraid of the people. So we've seen them all along saying they're concerned. What you know? Well, they're concerned about the people. Here, they're afraid. They're afraid what the people might do if they do this. Yes, sir. Sure. I and mean, you, you might call it irony, but I, I think God planned all this out to a perfect time because Passover, and Christ was the very one that Passover pointed to. Yeah. They were trying to destroy the very reason for their Passover feast. Uh, feast. Yeah. Their celebration. He was the reason for it. And that's how you do it. It's God's reason for that whole thing. Whole... Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't know if this is attributing too much to satanic attack, but being afraid and fear makes me think of that. So is this part of kind of helping show that this was all Satan's orchestration? We're going to see, we're going to see yeah. some, some very overt scriptures. Yeah, Satan's, Satan's guide some of these things for sure. Okay, good. That's question one. We good? Mm -hmm. Okay, with your, with your team. We're going to discuss question two. I'll give you like a minute before we go into the scriptures. <laughs> Number two, my question is, who kind of in preparation for this crucifixion, things are said in scripture, who anoints Jesus uh, with perfume? And why does this individual do it? In fact, which you remember this which is who anoints Jesus with perfume and why do they do it? And I thought it was Mary Magdalene. I'm pretty sure it was Mary, and I think it was Mary Magdalene. Right. It's basically showing you that he knew that this was the power of the Lord. This was going to happen. Right. You can think of anything that they're doing this for me. There's not. I don't either. 
Hey. We got, we got your, I normally ask you, but we're going to go to the scriptures and we'll let the scriptures share. But this is your, thank you for sharing good. Let's take a look at this one. And darn it, I had a good idea to use different colors. Like, yeah, I'm going to do this. Now. Okay, let's go to, um, what's that? Let me go back. <laughs> Start over. You could fix your spelling errors at the same time. Yeah. Okay. I did want to ask the noise. Two ends. Two ends, you know? Two ends here. In Start. the beginning, yeah. And I'm, I'm humble when you see maybe it's on your face. Tell me. Try at least correct me. Not the first time, the third time. Okay, let's go to Matthew 26. I heard some of you saying obviously the right answers, but let's try to pour into this a little bit here. Matthew 26, verse 6. And Stanton and Gary, you guys are up for the reading. Garnix, you're up for the first comment. Chapter 26 of Matthew's Gospel, verses 6 through 13. Now, when Jesus was in uh, Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when he saw it, they had a great nation saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath brought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Rarely I say unto you, whosoever this gospel shall be preached to the whole world, there is also this, that this woman hath done, be told for a memorial of her. Yeah. Okay, I'll start us off. Yeah. Opening comment or two. To answer well, the question, who knows Jesus for you and why? She is not even named specifically here. <laughs> okay, but you said it's a she. Yeah. I'll take it. I mean, do we say who we think she is, or are we just going to just from the scripture? Here? Okay. What we'll place some other scripture will shed some light on? Okay. The disciples are incensed, and Christ's reply it sh shows that he knows he's about to be put on the cross. He tells himself. He tells himself. Yeah. 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 How would you want me to write that, Jeremy? Four others. Christ, what? Last part you're saying, Christ. <laughs> Um, he tells them that you know, he's gonna, it's for his burial. Why well, trouble you the one for the ought to the good work upon me? So he's praising the woman for yeah. Now, you, a lot of you here, you know the next details, you know, you know why a little more there. Where, why they're upset, right? There's some legitimate reason why they're like, what are you doing? You know, and here we just go, oh, they're kind of upset. Okay. Well, I think it's interesting that he says that it'll be spoken of later in memory of her. Yeah. So this, this story of what she's done will be, will be told. And here it is, 2,000 years later, it's, it's being told. We're seeing this, this act that this woman did. Okay. And I really, again, I like all your facts, and I really like Ben how you recognize this is kind of the why part. All these little intricate details in scripture that, um, you know, I know we focus a lot in, in this church. We've looked at how many times did Christ predict or foretell his resurrection in scripture? How many times? Three. Three distinct times. This is really important because that's a big deal. I can tell you I'm going to die unless the rapture happens. Can't tell you I'm going to rise again. Uh, it's a huge deal. But here we see that Jesus is even saying, hey, no, I want to be buried. And that's going to happen. So no, he tells his disciples three times they don't believe. He tells her once she does believe. Good point. Good point. And obviously, there's something going on behind the scenes. I don't walk up to people and just, you know, annoy them. You know, so. Up there for yeah, just in case. You know, I don't know. It's COVID season. You never know. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, obviously, I was at work there too for her to do this act. Okay, let's go to the next account. We'll look at Mark's Gospel, chapter fourteen. Uh, one more. Come on, sorry. Yes, just speak out if I don't see you. Yeah, that's the oh, first. sure. One, one thing that I noticed. Yeah. And there is that the woman that did. They were in the home of a man, but the woman is the one that anointed him. 
Simon the leper. Simon the leper. So it's his house. Maybe, maybe it should have been him, right? You know, this is my house and I'm inviting you over, but yeah, she. Where did she come from? <laughs> why is, why is she? Well, he said, it says he's a leper. So. Yeah. Good. He was the Thank you, Wilma. Jesus. Okay, okay, Mark's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 3 through 9. Garnix, we're back to you. Black holes will have the first comment. Verses 3 through 9? Yes, please. While he was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper and reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume of pure nard, and she broke the vial and poured it over his head. But some were indignantly remarking to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii and the money given to the poor, and they were scolding her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you bother her? She has done a good deed to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you wish, you can do good to them, but you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. Okay, thanks, Alan. All right, Black Holes, comment or two? Mm -hmm. well, I don't know what oil of nard is. Maybe the <laughs> study Bible here has a note to that effect. But um, exactly, you mean exactly what it is. And she breaks the glass. So this is something that must have been a, like an essential oil that would evaporate away. And so once it's opened, uh, it, it has to be used. So it's it's going to be it's going to be wasted if it's not used. Okay, I just looking at my study Bible to see if it said what the it doesn't what the norm is. Okay, good. Um, right. And my, my Bible says um, in verse 6, when he's, Jesus is telling them not to bother her or whatever, and then it says, she's done a noble thing for me. And so she, yeah, she saw something there that the disciples didn't see. Cool. I'm going to put my word in too. Mike says beautiful, noble, or, or a beautiful thing. What she's done is it's good. Mm -hmm. Okay. What is 300 pence? It's kind of putting a value to it. Okay, so we see we see in this case a value. Yours says what? 300 what? Pence. Pence. What are, how is your other kind of thing? Denari. 300 denari. Does anybody have a note or anybody have been to the study before kind of know what that is? How much that is? Denarius was about a day's wage. Right. So that's almost so three. That's a lot. Of, that's a very that's a lot costly. Yeah. She just does. One year's wage. Yeah. Like permission. She just does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I have other questions like, where did she get this? You know, that's a lot. Was she well off? Was she not well off? Jesus has some comments like, you're going to have a poor amongst you. Right. You're always going to have me. Right. So I don't strike, strike that she's like well to do. Um, so I don't know if they had, had if this is from the same place as then, but the nard, it says, is a class of aromatic amber colored essential oil derived yes. from Nardostachys jadamansi, a flowering plant in the honeysuckle family that grows in the Himalayas of Nepal, China, and India. So I don't know if it was more widespread then or if it was also from there then. Yeah, Part of what made it right, right yeah. made it more expensive. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, obviously. Oh, and its aroma was woody, spicy, and musty. Sounds good, Jeremy. Like, <laughs> 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 <Dark oil going. laughs> so, yes. The other thing too is when you were making that comment about you always have the poor with you. My verse says that you can do what is good for them whenever you want, but you do not always have me. So mm -hmm. the time to do something good for Jesus was coming to a close. They, they weren't going to be able to do something good for him soon. Yeah. But the poor, they could. Good. Thank you. Okay, cool. So kind of, kind of vague here. A little more specificity here. Anything else? Yes. That I yep. Yep. I like from uh, verse nine. He says, uh, "This gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world." So it's kind of like foreshadowing what the gospel is going to be. But then I also find it interesting that he says that she hath done shall be spoken of a memorial for her. Mm -hmm. So basically, he's saying that she's going to get mentioned in the gospel, and here we are reading about it. Yeah, we should put in some connecting ideas. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's interesting that they would first think of the poor that they could do things for instead of specifically mentioning believers, but the poor. You know what I mean? Because the poor encompasses all of them. 
Right. So I, I don't know. Yeah. It just seems well, more like a modern world thing of, well, you need to go out and do good things and you do good things for the poor and you feed them and, you know. But I they're in Israel. I know. Yeah, but as I look at Jesus' ministry, I kind of think of it more in terms of the first part. He was going out to the poor and the mm -hmm. sick and the weak. He really wasn't just, all right, believers here. I mean, he was with his, with his disciples and such like that. Well, it tells you about some people question their motive by saying that, by saying, well, they were really more concerned about the money than they were before. But Jesus doesn't question the motive. Yeah. So if there was any there like um, Judas, who genuinely was more concerned about the money, there might have been actually a genuine concern for the poor here. Because Jesus doesn't say, no, you're just concerned about how yeah. this is affecting you financially. He doesn't question that at all. So the, even though a lot of Bible commentators will question that, Jesus said. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. There's a statement of fact here that says the poor will be with you always. always. Yep. So you can't give everything to them because they'll always be poor. <laughs> There's a process. It's good to give, but if you give everything, you'll be in the poorhouse too. Yeah. So they're always with you. <laughs> yeah. There's, I think there's a fine line there because if you give the poor everything that they need, there's no reason for them to do anything. Yeah. Now it's starting to get the social welfare <laughs> and those kind of issues. But I think it's, it is legitimate that Jesus, and maybe this group he's with, maybe they were really good at giving to the poor. Maybe when they saw this, they're like, hey, that could have been used for the poor. Maybe he's just providing them over and over. Hey, she's done this good. That's right. I'm going to be very excited. He had already given food and a lot of stuff to the poor. Let's take a look at one more. Let's go to John. John's Gospel, chapter 12. I don't normally read this Bible, my Bible this way, where I try to look at all the accounts in these gospel stories. It's kind of fun. It just opens up new new leaves of these accounts. John's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 1 through 12. And Ronnie, you're up. Ben and Wilma, you guys have the first word. One through twelve. One through eight. One through eight. Um, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, the one Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha was serving them, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. And then Mary took a pound of fragrant, fragrant oil, pure and expensive nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped his feet with her hair. So the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was about to betray him, said, wasn't why wasn't this fragrant oil sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He mm -hmm. was in charge of the money bag and would steal part of what was put in it. Jesus answered, Leave her alone. She has kept it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Mm -hmm. I almost want to go, dun, dun, dun. We're <laughs> reading about Judas there. We see yeah. Some. Okay, um, Ben and Wilma, we see some more details here. What do you see? Lazarus is there. That's who was resurrected. And uh, they named her. Her name's Mary. Okay, so the she is who? Mary. 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 And, and uh, yeah, it always gets confusing to me because there's a number of Mary. Mm -hmm. in the Bible. But we got a name. Okay. Martha served. Okay, so we see Martha's there. So now we're seeing some more of the other, the other people, and maybe we can do a study to say what else, what other conversations do we have with these people in scripture. We won't do that today, but yes. Judas was there. Judas is there. And the reason why he's bringing up the price is because he's, he's getting a little bit of it. He's, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. he's taking a, a money holder tax. Oh, man. When he first said that, when I was reading through this, Previously, I was like, eh, that's not a bad comment. <laughs> <laughs> but it starts off like, hey, this should be doing before. So what was he doing? He's pilfering. He was, yeah, pilfering. He was stealing. He's that's trying not... to be a government. 
<laughs> he was taxing the poor. Yeah. That's why he was all concerned about the amount of money, is because then that would take away from him. That's right. Hey, that's a year's amount. Peggy says they aren't convinced this is the same story. Of uh, the well, the woman with the nard. Okay. I because I, on in one instance it's feet, in the other instance it's head, but it's the same oil. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he gives the same reason it's for his burial. Yeah. And this, there's a thing about the poor with the money. Too. In there. And I had a, a note, Peggy, or Tim, if you're watching this, just from one of Tim's previous studies, because I got tripped up on the dates. You know, I see things like, oh, that says six days before the Passover. Another count says two days. And Tim had done a study years ago talking about the six days, probably referred to the temple date um, for Passover based off a lunar calendar. And so, okay, maybe it was two different dates. Sure. With what is said from the previous account we read, all of the disciples were in agreement with what Judas says here. So they're all saying the same thing. The picture seems to be here that Judas makes it a point oh, first because yeah. he's the most intense by because he's, he's feeling the bag. Jesus knows his motives and it's important here. The other disciples don't know his motives, their motives. Jesus doesn't question. Yeah. And so there's a possibility that you have two things going on here. One with unpure motives, one with good motives, and he doesn't point out to everybody Judas's motives. He doesn't even point out that the other motives are good. He just makes a comment, you'll have the four always with you. That's a blanket statement that they can take it or leave it for, for what it wants. But the point is, some of their motives possibly were good. Judas is obviously wasn't. He yeah. might have initiated or it might have been a different event, but it would seem to be the same event, but um, with just two different motives going on here. And Jesus, Jesus records Judas's motives, but he doesn't point it out to the yeah. disciples. Yeah. Your writing is under Luke, not John. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Just, yeah. I, have a, I have a little bit of a question. Yeah. I'm wondering how John came to do this. If Jesus told him, or if God just kind of let him know to write it because he knew that Judas was stealing. So I'm wondering, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, you guys, this, they, is, this is 60 years after the event that this is written down. Yeah. So, so did you think that it came out that he was stealing or who's the Holy Spirit to tell him what the Holy Spirit revealed it to him? Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. I, you'd have to put it back because yeah. who could know? Yeah. Je Jesus was crucified 60 years before John re records it. John writes it's almost 100 AD but it occurred about 30 AD. So uh, 60 years has elapsed since the, this event. So apparently the Holy Spirit has revealed this. Yeah. But your question is valid because at least in my text, it doesn't say, and Jesus said, you don't care about the poor, you're a thief. This, these are interior motives, like Jim was mentioning. Yeah. Because you look at the, the other gospels and they don't really mention it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. And to me, it's kind of a game changer, you know, as far as motives that we can see into the, because we can't, we can't see motives, but you can see into the motives here. It's explicit. The other thing, too, is there's another detail mentioned in this one yeah. about when Mary anointed him, it's she um, oh, yeah. wiped his feet with Thank her you. hair. Okay, and maybe that's why Peggy, if, if you want to add, please do, guys. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe that's why she was seeing this in a different account. Because what did the other one say? It was here. Oh, his head. So oh. here we see the feet with her hair. And, and maybe she both. She did both, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, that's how I took it. That, yeah, I just see it's real humility, right? Of, of somebody just right. telling it, just and it's and it's all and it tells us it's in preparation for his burial. Yeah, in, in this account, I think it's the the six days before the Passover is telling you when they arrived, not necessarily that the oh, entire event happened six Jesus days before the Passover. Me. Yeah, right. That it might be that they arrived six days before okay. and then. Two days, before. two days before, or yeah, which is four days later. Yeah, this would have happened. Thank you. Oh, and this is okay. So, sorry. Yeah, no. <laughs> so here it says she had a whole pound of this stuff. Yeah, um, uh -huh. Okay, and, and uh, John's the other one's just said a vial, which makes you think it's a much smaller amount, but a pound of it. I mean, well, are you weighing the vial? Yeah, it's a big jar. Yeah, big jar. It could be like a pint. I mean, a, a gallon of, of water is 8.8 .8 pounds, right? Um, yeah. So it doesn't have to be essential oil could be a little bit lighter than that, but still a but it's, that would be less significant, at least a maybe a more to find yourself. Right.
but not, I mean, when they say vial, I'm picturing yeah. I know, like a little, little perfume vial. Yeah. That's still a pretty small <laughs> size for a year's wages to pay for it. I mean, yeah. Very expensive, very expensive yeah. stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering. Yeah. Why is in all of this that it's the women that are anointing him? Mm -hmm. Why a woman versus a man? Is that? Yeah. Why? Why? Why are, is it just the women that are anointing him, but there, there's not a man? <laughs> yeah. Isn't that know. kind of typically part of the women's job? Because it was women that went after the fact to prepare his body with spices and everything. So is that just part in their culture of their yeah. role? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, you see after the, even the crucifixion, women are going in there. I don't know. So is it like a woman's job? As a, as a <laughs> so like person that they might be interested to marry? Do they really know what's all going on here? I mean, it's not easy. Well, we can only know what scripture indicates. <laughs> yeah. And in my reading these studies, I think, I think God let her know that it, she did this, tells us for his burial. I think that she believed. Yeah. That she, she gets a special slot in the story, it yeah. says, because she, she believed, believed beyond what the oh, disciples are. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it's really curious that the disciples don't even see what's going on tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because we're going to see some of that in the next conversation for two weeks. It's good, you guys. I love discussing this stuff, even if there's still some questions out there. Okay. Anything else as we close up this part? Again, we're looking at these biblical accounts, the details of Christ's life. Okay, let's look at question three. Go ahead and talk about it here. This would be a, this would be a, maybe a, a shorter. Number three is who who agrees to betray Jesus and why? Talk me about it. Your team. Who agrees to betray Jesus and why? Judas for so long. I don't think there's any and, other motive besides money, is there? Because he's not going to take, he's finally just going to, he's not going to take the kingship. And Judas is not going to be the guy in charge of the state's purse. He's like, he's oh, because if he's not taking the kingdom, he's not accepting the kingship. Because he's like, this guy's popular. You could if you wanted to. Right. It drives up. And it makes it mad that he's not going to move. Yeah. Rick, you guys are awesome. Thank you for, thank you for it's kind of hushed like we're almost playing a game. Like, <laughs> <laughs> we're too close to this. Everybody can hear our discussion. Yeah. I don't want to say anything wrong. <laughs> Make sure it's accurate. <laughs> okay. Um, question three. As we continue just move, moving forward in the narrative, what happened in those final days? Uh, who agrees to trade Jesus and why? Whose turn are we? Oh, we we, we read, read last time. You just read? No, they read. Okay, yeah. Ben, you're up. Bangs, you've got the first comment as we look at this. Let's go to, let's we'll start with Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26. Again, this study was kind of inspired by the idea of read it, read it, read it which we've been talking about. So let's read it. Yeah. Uh, Matthew 26, verses 14 through 16. 14 through 16. Oh, I can 14 through 16, Lola. Then one of the 12, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, what are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 silver coins. From then on, Judas was watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Okay. Thank you, Wilma. Bangs, what do you get? Give us a comment or two. Who agreed to betray Jesus and why? Judas. Dun, dun, dun. dun, dun, dun. <laughs> yeah, he was the money okay. person. And he What's his last name? We're going to be specific. His money train was close and shut up. It's scary. <laughs> and he's scary. a scary. <laughs> he's a scary person. And why? Actually, you know, it's, 
there's there's other well, the reason I ask is other Judas's right? Mm -hmm. right and are they all bad dudes no no in fact one of our missionary friends they named their kid Judas you don't see too many kids you know, <laughs> you, you got to be careful on certain names, and I'm not going to point them out. There are names like I would just would name my son that. <laughs> based on the description. Yeah. <laughs> That's true, right? <laughs> okay, uh, Judas is scary. Thank you. Anything else from you guys before we open up the others? He's just looking for a way to betray him, to tell the soldiers uh, who he is. Yeah, he initiated it. And I'm thinking it's oh, kind of yeah. interesting, the way that he's kind of getting tempted, isn't that a satanic temptation? Well, he, he's, kind of he's, not, yeah. he's not saved. Yeah, but Satan can still tempt him. Yeah, but it wouldn't be, a, uh, it'd be part of his nature. A, yeah. We're going to see Satan as more than, more than just tempted. Anyway, right. right. Absolutely. This is, this is greed. He's already on greed. Greed. He's from yeah. Satan's greed. Greed. Oh, yeah. 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 Yes. He's already on Satan's Okay, greed. other people. Uh, what do we see from these short verses? Judas did it for money. 30 pieces? Isn't that 30 pieces of silver. That's, Easily bought. There's 30 pieces of silver. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. And he kept looking for ways to betray him. It wasn't any 300 pence, let's just say that. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't That's a ton not, of money. Maybe somebody <laughs> study Bible says how much 30 silver coins is. Obviously, without looking, this is perf this prophetic and, and some of the things that, are, that go on with some prophes prophecy to fill. But if it is a study Bible, I'm just curious to how much that greed was. It'd be interesting if it was like 10 bucks. Yeah. Uh -huh. like, I can't think it was because in the end, what is it used to buy? A plot of land. A plot of land after you know the story ends, he returns it. It's used by a, a field, and so obviously that's more expensive than a, a loaf of bread or whatever. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other just from this context? Sorry, I didn't mean to jump ahead. Oh, it was a specific amount. Yeah, thirty silver coins. Yep. Okay, let's go to the next one. Again, these are pretty short. Let's put them Okay, I, I don't know how accurate this is, sorry, yeah. but yep. this site here that I found says, in Hebrew culture, 30 pieces of silver wasn't a lot of money. We knew that. It was the exact price paid to the master of a slave if and when his slave was gored by an ox. So the slave's death was compensated by 30 pieces. Oh. So if you have a slave gored by an ox, you know what the going rate is, yeah. <laughs> but the, the Old Testament really did have those details. They would say, oh, yeah. this yeah. much for this. Right. But that thing, again, if they're Christ, he gave he and the suffering servant. Yeah. 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 Good point. Good point. Let's look at Mark uh, chapter 14, verses 10 and 11. Mark 14, 10. 14, 10, and 11. Which one? Yeah, Mark chapter 14, verses 10 and 11, Stanton and Gary. All right. Um, and Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went unto the chief priest to betray him unto them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he saw how he might conveniently betray him. Okay, any additional details from this? Oh, they were delighted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The who was delighted? The, the chief priest. Yeah, the chief the priest. Okay. So we see I we see this connection to the chief priest. So you come when you answer this question, who agrees to betray Jesus is actually more than just one answer. I mean, this is the main culprit, but these guys are in on it. And what did you say they were delighted? Yeah. Well, we got our guy. We got a, a guy willing to do the dirty work. Yeah. Okay. Other comments. They didn't pay him then because they promised to give him money. So I don't know. I don't remember when they agreed it would be given. Was it after they after got him? Right. And so then he's willing to do it not for money, but not for money at the same time because they could have changed their mind. Yeah. So when the job's done, we'll, we'll pony up the money. He doesn't want to get caught. He's looking for an opportune time. It's not like to betray him from the end point. Hmm? It's he not said like he was he's looking willing for ways to, to sacrifice himself right. to get rid of this guy. Mm -hmm. We'll see that play out. How, how, how his, I always think it's interesting. Like They knew who Jesus was. He was in the public spectrum. It wasn't like nobody knew. Like, mm -hmm. Show us the guy. 
but yet this is the way that, and for a good reason, why how it went down. Both, for the yeah. yeah, both Matthew and Mark specifically mention that he's one of the 12. He's not just some random yep. person that knows who Jesus is. And yeah, he, one of the 12, yeah. absolutely. Thank you. This is a big deal. Like, mm. when, I, when I feel like I let God down, you know, Steve, you have to deal with resting in Christ and not feeling shame and realizing that God is good. Um, but you don't want to let God down, you know, in in your life. And I think of Judas and how obviously he's close. Jesus selected him. And here, those close guys is gonna do the ultimate act of betrayal. Another thing too, with with that idea, is that um, you know, I don't know, maybe this is reading into it, but somebody like Judas, who was one of Jesus's close followers, yeah. one of the disciples, and it's like, you know, he can if he could fall victim to something like that, you know, satanical, whatever influence that you, you believers, you know, just we may be following, you know, we may be doing our Christian thing or whatever, but we are really be successful. Yeah. Good point. We're we're encouraged in New Testament scripture, right? Put on armor. Yeah, for sure. Let's look at one more, guys, and we'll close with this one for our time. Thank you today. Uh, Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Are we on the garnets? Is that right? Yeah. Okay, close this out, guys. We'll look at this last account 22 verses 3 through 6. We'll see a couple. Three and Satan entered into Judas, who was called Iscariot. Iscariot, belonging to the number of twelve. And he went away in disgust, disgust with the chief priests, how fierce and officers, and officers, how he might betray him to them. They were glad and agreed to give him money so he consented and began seeking a good opportunity to betray him to them apart from the crowd thank you Clinton. okay black holes closing comments what do you see here well the last thing that he mentioned in, in this passage that talks about um uh, when the crowd wasn't present apart from the crowd so that's a different thing. He's sneaking. He's sneaking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Others, or, or talk, talk about oh. Satan. Satan, Satan, yes. Yeah, man, yeah. that, that kind of makes it a little more intense. That's a little bit more than a temptation, right? That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah it's like yeah. strong yeah. resolve to get into dwelling. Yeah, yeah, that's strong resolve to get the job, the dirty yeah. job done. Yeah. Anybody else? I find it interesting that the Sanhedrin didn't have a bounty collected already. That they they had, they waited until you know. Satan tempts this guy, and then he shows up, and then they're like, oh, hey, let's collect some money for this. Well, they have advertised that, but that would have been a violation of law to do that. It would have been a public declaration of guilt. But to have somebody come to them and offer it in secret, where the crowds weren't aware of it, they could get away with it. Very good. 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 You guys, thank you. Um, you to agree. If I ever get a sub job again, we'll continue to look at this. It's just really fascinating to see scripture speaking for scripture and little nuggets of things that that we can pull out and see the context uh, through the various stories. Let's close with a word of prayer, and then we've got 10 minutes to get upstairs. All right, let's pray. God, thank you again for your word. Thank you for allowing the Holy Spirit to ultimately be the teacher. Thanks for these friends sharing together today around it. God, we... I just want to, you know, intellectually know a bunch of facts leading up, but just to really appreciate how, how Christ 
was willing to be vulnerable for us and you know these details of betrayal and punishment and pain and mocking and he just willingly willingly moved toward the cross allowing these details to play out and ultimately he gave his life for our our sins and we don't take that lightly we thank you God we thank you we have a resurrected savior that uh, one day he dwells in us now but one day we'll be right with him we look forward to that. Thank you for this time and uh, for the time upstairs now. Amen. <laughs> it, it, it was the